Time now for our news review. We'll begin with the Chinese stocks again, and this time it's the Financial Times reporting that the government in Beijing has decided to abandon attempts to boost the country's stock market through large-scale share purchases. Instead, the country's leaders are planning to focus on punishing those who have taken advantage of the state bailouts. According to the Wall Street Journal, following China's crash last week, the shake-up of global markets rattled investors but proved that the majority still see the U.S. markets as the best place to put money. The Italian energy group Eni has discovered what it says is a supergiant gas field off the coast of Egypt. Gulf News reporting that it's the largest ever found in the Mediterranean Sea. The Financial Times Companies and Markets is looking at whiskey investment. According to this story, UK investments in fine whiskey are up 35% compared to the same period last year. The New York Times next reporting on a debate amongst TV executives over whether the production of more scripted entertainment programs is a good or bad thing for the industry. And according to the Daily Telegraph, sticky fingers and soggy cones may soon be a thing of the past. Scientists claim to have invented an ice cream which doesn't melt in the sun. That's the Scottish sun, apparently. They're from Edinburgh. It doesn't sound like an ice cream, <laughs> then, does it? Lawrence Gosling is here, Editor-in-Chief at Investment Week. Good morning to you, Lawrence. Good morning. So has China's government changed tack, according to the Financial Times, in trying to deal with the crisis? Yeah, I mean, they've had a complete about-face about on this. I mean, you go, you go back sort of two months and the market in, in, uh, in China was dropping. And it's important to remember that the rise of the, the Chinese stock market was good for China, the country, because it was a way of sort of giving the population more, more wealth. They shifted away from investing in property a couple of years ago towards the sort of share market in the way perhaps, you know, Western investors do. Um, Government tried to prop it up because it dropped 37 per cent by um, getting their own investment funds to buy up shares and that, and that, that strategy failed and there 's been a lot of criticism on the ground in China amongst ordinary investors and as you just sort of said, you know journalists have been arrested and people accused of manipulating the market by spreading rumours, which is kind of not the language we, we would use. Well, it's really interesting because yeah it 's right across social media mm. journalists are being told that you shouldn 't put unfavourable reports out um, on the markets. But interesting you say that, though, because uh, during the financial crash here, some people were pointing fingers at journalists in this country saying you shouldn't be speculating about the health of certain banks, for example. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a real, real, real fine line. I mean, a lot of the commentary that the Chinese authorities have been talking about is just people putting up market opinions saying, I think the market is going to drop. That's not, that's not manipulation. Um, that said, there's been quite a number of sort of significant hedge funds um, who've made a huge amount of money in the last sort of two or three months from, from shorting. So in other words, betting that the Chinese stock market was going to go down. And that, that's, that's um, scared the Chinese authorities quite a lot. This is all quite, sort of quite worrying, really, if you're a Western uh, investment institution. What will Investment Week's op-ed or editorial say, the next one? Keep investing in China or just hang back a little bit? I think it's, it's, a, it's a classic where we, we talk about investing for the long term. You, you get these kind of periods with you know, what, what are emerging stock markets. We've seen it in India and Brazil over the years. We will say stick with it, but uh, expect more volatility. Especially given that the stock market rose by around 150%, didn't it, in, in less than a year. So no wonder then perhaps that the Wall Street Journal is actually mm. saying, look, uh, the majority of people still see US markets as the best place to put money. Yeah, and it, you know, if you're a professional long-term investor or even a private investor, what's happened, you know, the, the US market came off a little bit, quite, well, actually quite significantly last week on the back of what was going on in, with China. It was a phenomenal buying opportunity. And you've, you, you know, you saw the US markets finished last week up even though earlier in the week we had, you know, this time last week was called Black Monday. It was a terrible day for, for the markets. Um, the U.S. economy is growing really, really well. We saw some great numbers on, on Thursday. GDP was much higher. Um, and uh, we've had the, the Jackson Hole meeting going on at the moment with the central bankers. And people are much more relaxed about what, what's going to happen with U.S. interest rates. So expectation generally is we won't get a rise, well, tomorrow or ne next month, September, Possibly later in the year, on my personal view, is it will probably be in the, sort of in the spring of next year. And that's made people more confident about the, the, the um, American stock market. Okay, now in Gulf <coughs> News, this mm. uh, find by any, which is 30% owned by the Italian state. Yes. But it's got to be about Egypt, hasn't it? Egypt owes something like, I'm not totally sure of my figures, I think it's about 90% of its GDP it owes to the rest of the world. It needs everything it can get. Everything it can get. And, you know, for an economy like that, 
um, they're, they're very reliant on importing energy. So, um, you know, I mean, any have been operating through one of its subsidiaries since the 1950s. So their relationship with, with Egypt is really strong. But this, you know, potentially gives um, Egypt near, near um, self-sufficiency in, in energy, um, particularly sort of gas. Um, you know, it, uh, once the fields are really up and running, which will probably take a good five years, mm. But it could potentially all be about the rebuilding, not of just of the, the uh, Egyptian economy, but also the wider Egyptian society as well. Yeah, Egypt is actually one of the most diversified of all the Middle mm. Eastern economies. It doesn't only rely on oil and petroleum and gas. But this, could, could it possibly help? I, I, I think President Sisi has two issues. Security, first of all, yeah. which... To a certain extent, it's difficult to control. If someone wants to blow themselves up, they will. But the yes. economy is the other big issue that he can resolve. How much can this help Egypt overall? Well, we've, we've seen tremendous poverty in Egypt, you know, since the so-called so Arab Spring. This could generate the, the sort of wealth that's spread across, the, you know, a, a broader part of the Egyptian population. So uh, you, you're absolutely right. This could, I think, bring them the political security they need as well as the economic security. And protect them from the volatility of the energy market. So let's yes. move on to the Financial Times mm. companies and markets. It's looking at whiskey yes. investment. Apparently, people are spending huge sums now on buying up rare whiskies. It certainly seems though it could be a, a safer place to put your money, perhaps? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the, 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 the FT article does sort of point out that there's a huge disparity in the top performing sort of whiskies and the worst performing whiskies. I mean, the top performing ones, you know, have gone up sort of 35 percent. You know, the worst performing ones have actually gone down you know, close to 15 percent. And it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of distilleries that have stopped making um, for, for whatever reason. So you're in a classic sort of supply and demand sort of scenario. Um, interestingly enough, um, it's, it's, it's a Japanese distillery that uh, produced the best performing sort of whiskey over the last year. And we've heard a lot about how art, fine wines, yes. whiskey, they're all uh, potentially really good investments for the yes. future certain types even Lego apparently that was a story uh, kicking around over the weekend yeah I mean Le Lego has become phenomenally popular and actually again the older sets of Lego particularly if they're complete around sort of characters such as Star Wars are, are becoming incredibly valuable particularly in, in the US so forget stocks and shares it's Lego you've got to invest in that's right <laughs> <laughs> so the International New York Times I mean it's often been said that consumers have just too much choice and they mm. can't eventually sift the wheat from the chaff and uh, this argument is now being made about American television I was in the US a few weeks ago and I was looking through the TV with the TV remote control I said to my wife we're now on program 3941 <laughs> it was ridiculous yeah I think I think you know it, it, this is again symptomatic of the way we're all consuming um, you know TV and films and and you know the um, the article sort of point, points out actually that uh, um, we as viewers almost can't differentiate between a TV program and, and, a, and a film and the number of sort of script, scripted sort of programs is estimated to double from about 200 to 400 you know over, over the sort of course of the next couple of years and you, you know to your point about three and a half thousand <laughs> channels 400 programs to watch you know at nine o'clock on, 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 on a night. Is, but if you do have a that one hit show it's extremely important for the TV company and for the stars who start you know, who star in it they their following goes up massively much more than if they appeared in the film. Yeah, and we, you know, often we like to download a whole series and, and watch it almost kind of back to back in the way that we you know, used to when, when DVD collections were sort of really important. So, you know, it's about the changing sort of nature of consumption. Your children, our children, consume differently from us. But I tell you what, from an investor's point of view, mm. again, can you make money out of investing in TV? And can you actually, can I, as a small investor, invest in a TV production? Is it possible? Yes, you can. There's one of the government uh, tax back schemes, enterprise investment schemes, often back uh, TV productions. And again, if you get the right TV program, yeah. um, you can make you know quite quite good money as an investor with relatively low risk. Now you talk about TV consumption. What about ice cream consumption? Ice cream. We've got to get to this story yes. in the Daily Telegraph. A non-melting ice cream has apparently been invented. Can yeah. you believe it? Uh, well, I think can you believe it by, by Scottish scientists, which you know, risk of scariest hyping. There's not a lot of sunshine there. Interestingly enough, as well, um, they, they think their invention might have less um, saturated fat in it, fat in it, so it could be healthy as well, well as not melting. Apparently three years, though, before it's going to reach the market. That will be one interesting ice cream to see. Takes away the joy of it, though, doesn't it? Because that's the thing, you just want to yeah. finish it before it melts. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, in, in Moscow, in the middle of winter, when it's minus 20 or something, ice creams sell like hotcakes, not the right <laughs> phrase, because the ice cream's actually warmer.
than the outside air. Amazing. Thanks. Lawrence Cosby, thanks very much Thank indeed. You. Have a lovely week. Stay off for you, though. Stay off. <laughs> bye bye.